Welcome everyone. I'm delighted to have you here today. And thank you to all of our panelists as well as the Armory. Um, our topic today is the U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, one of the most visible sites on the international art circuit, and one that brings pressures, opportunities, and historical complexities as a context in which to curate and present work. Our panelists know this space very well and intimately, having produced, um, as we heard in the introductions, major exhibitions on Bruce Nauman in 2009, that was Carlos's exhibition, Martin Perrier in 2019, uh, from Brooke, and Simone Lee, the first black woman to represent the U.S. at the Biennale uh, this year and through early November of 2022, is Ava, Ava's exhibition that is going to be a show, a traveling exhibition opening at the ICA in Boston this spring. And we very much look forward to hearing from each of them. Again, the timing of this panel aligns not coincidentally with an exhibition at the Jewish Museum right now, which covers the years 1962, 63, and 64, which culminates in an installation of work that showed up at the American Pavilion um, in 1964, uh, Venice Biennale, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, can I get the first slide, please? So many of you know this building already. It's a sober-looking structure located at the Giardini Park um, on the southeast end of Venice, and it's the work of the American architects William Adams Delano and Chester Holmes Aldrich, who completed the building in 1930. I show this slide in some ways to show the building in its naked state, since so much of what we've seen in recent years has involved complicating, altering, and otherwise reimagining this Monticello-like facade and all of the associations that its design and space brings. Important to keep in mind as a backdrop to the Venice Biennale, this building is owned by the Guggenheim, and the selection process is overseen by the State Department, um, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, could I get the next one? You're looking here at the, at the map of the grounds with a little arrow pointing to the location of the U.S. Pavilion. And it's really kind of a fairgrounds of the art world with the American Pavilion right at the center flanked by Israel on one side and the Nordic countries on the other. And the whole layout of these spaces, as many of you know, is predicated on the idea of these different national voices in dialogue with one another, yet representing their own distinct positions. Um, next slide, if I could. And one more. Oh, I think I'm missing. Oh, uh, well, okay. Just imagine an image of Alan Solomon wearing dark sunglasses in 1964, standing next to the 39 year old Robert Rausenberg. Um, as many of you know, there we go. Thank you. Um, as many of you know, the, the curation of the pavilions often really boils down to the vision of a curator working closely with the vision of an artist. And in this case, again, you're looking at Solomon on the right and Rauschenberg on the left in 64. And again, this was when Solomon was uh, the director of the Jewish Museum at the time, and he was really focused on showcasing the latest of contemporary art um, at the museum, which was a major platform for young artists like Rauschenberg and Jonas at the time. Um, and then if I can get the next slide. This is just an installation of some of the works that appeared in that 64 pavilion. It's important to notice that this was a group exhibition um, with a wide range of work of artists like Noland and Stella, as well as Rauschenberg and Johns. Um, but it was not, again, a one-person show, and this led to some difficulty for Solomon and, and many others who were very keen to see Rauschenberg win the Golden Lion Prize, um, which we'll talk about again. It's, it's a very important part of the, uh, of the lexicon of events around the, of the Venice Biennale. And then if I could get the, the next slide. Fine. Okay, we're slightly out of order here. Um, can you go back a couple of slides to a picture of a boat in water? There we go. Okay. Um, he didn't quite understand that in order to qualify to win the Golden Lion Prize, a certain number of works by the artist had to be on site at the pavilion. And most of Rauschenberg's works were actually hanging over at the American consulate. So in a frantic effort to meet the criteria, he rushed a group of paintings by boat from the consulate over to the pavilion, and he set them up just in time to be um, considered by the jury, which did eventually award the prize of the Golden Lion to Rauschenberg. And this did stir some controversy that still crops up in discussions, not only about Rauschenberg's work, but also about 
the pavilion process and the Golden Lion process more broadly, how it works, who decides uh, what should appear, and just the weight and the prominence of uh, the pavilion for the artist whose work it features. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our curators, starting with Carlos. And we're, we're sort of going in chronological order, starting in 2009, just to talk about some of the factors that went into your planning of, of the pavilion. Thank you. Uh, I love to see those images of the boats, and the, the consulate was right next to the very building house. So it was, you know, what my dad drew, like the whole drama of 64. Um, uh, Darcy asked us to um, start by saying what we said that what, what we said to accomplish uh, when we started to think about organizing the pavilion. I, I I have to preface by saying that at the time I was teaching at the university at one of the, of the two universities in Venice. There's two very big campuses. One is the University of the Ua, Instituto Universitario de Arquitectura de Venezia, and then Clafo Oscari. And they represent something I believe very beautiful in Venice, which is the possibility of a use of the city that has to do with learning, with researching, with the life of students, and not just with tourism. Um, I, um, uh, one day, I have been uh, teaching in Venice before I um, started working at the museum. I had um, proposed a show at the Museum of an Italian artist called Michelangelo Pistoletto. I started working in 2005, and the director at the time, and that man could say, okay, your show is in the schedule in five years. And I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And so I was like, you know, trying to come up with something to, you know, keep myself busy in the meantime. And my colleague Michael Taylor, you know, uh, who was a great curator of modern art at the time, you know, just got an email from the the State Department, and that's the way in which we, you know, were somewhat uh, invited. It was like an open invitation uh, mentioned in the pavilion. He said, well, you're in Venice, well, why don't we think about something for, for the pavilion? I, um, I wasn't really encouraged because the shows that I had seen there recently were not really that interesting, the use of the pavilion. Was, and I said, well, what do you have in mind? He suggested something that I couldn't, you know, that I didn't quite like, and then at the time, we were in the process of acquiring a very important work that was now man called The True Artist Helps the World by Reading Mr. Truth. It's a window of wall sign. You might have seen it or heard of it. You, know, you might have seen it. It's a spiral. It's very beautiful. And it was going to, like, to I mean, it costed us you know, quite a bit for a time. And, you know, I had been working with a completely different group of artists. I had, you know, come to the museum after doing a show called Tropicalia, which was in the 60s. In any case, I said, oh my God, we're going to devote all this energy to buy the work of an artist that is great, but it's very canonical, and it's not what I felt. But, you know, that gave me an opportunity to look into Nauman, and I felt that, well, his interrogation in the, that work of the relationship between public space and private space might be something that could be translated into the structure of Venice. Um, that, on one hand, the, you know, on the other hand, the idea of the city itself and how public and public spaces have been used historically, and the idea about taking this symbol of American presence in Venice and trying to connect it to the tissue of the city in terms of working very closely with the universities. So all those things came into being for the project, and we will we can talk a little bit about the project later. I don't want to take too much time. Okay, great. Um, Brooke, do you have some slides that we want to advance to? Okay. okay. Is that on? Yeah. yeah, I think if we can advance the per year slides to the second set of slides. Keep going. Yep. Yeah, we'll go over this. There, there we, we go. go. Thank you. Um, such an honor to be on the stage. Darcy, Carlos, and Ava today, so I'm thrilled. Um, Darcy had asked us to kind of trace our relationships with the artist whose work we uh, commissioned for Venice. Um, I have known Martin Currier for about three decades, and that's because I worked at the Jamaica Art Center in Queens with Kelly Jones and Thelma Golden on Martin's exhibition in the late 1980s that 
went to the Sao Paulo Biennial. Martin represented the U.S. in Sao Paulo. I was a rookie of rookies then, um, and I worked on the exhibition catalog that accompanied the Sao Paulo Biennial. In 2013, when I got to Madison Square Park here in New York City, Martin was one of the first artists I contacted to talk about a commission for the site. Um, and in 2016, we opened this work called Big Bling, which is a towering, monumental, 40-foot tall, extraordinary sculpture made of laminated plywood and chain link fencing that wrapped around the stories or layers or levels um, of the structure. The work has a gilded shackle at the top of the piece, um, which is an ambiguous metaphor. A shackle, of course, works um, to for everyone to, to think about uh, enslaved people. Um, but the, the ambiguity here is that it's golden and that people reach for it almost like it's the gold ring at the top of the, of the work. Um, anyway, this was foundational in our relationship with Martin about um, uh, working together for Venice and presenting his exhibition um, in Venice in 2019. Next slide, please. What you see here are, these are photos of the installation in Venice, and that laminated plywood that was the material for Big Bling um, that was made at a factory in upstate New York called Unilam, that was the material and the same fabricator that we uh, worked with to bring this piece called Swallowed Sun, Monstrance and Volume to Venice. Next slide, please. Here is the installed, oh, go back one. Thank you. This is the installed piece. Um, Martin worked together with our exhibition designers, Todd Williams and Billy Chen, to create a wall. Uh, but it's, an, it's a wall that you can see through. Remember, the word wall had enormous meaning in 2019 because this was during the height or the nadir of the Trump presidency, um, and border walls are being constructed and discussed constantly across this country. So Martin uh, made a veil-like structure, a wall that went across the opening of the pavilion, but then behind that wall, next slide, please, um, was this circular undulating form that was bound in canvas and rope um, and it summoned the tail of a dragon. It was a fine buttress that came out of the um, partition and into a very sculptural form, but that was also demonic and dark and symbolized a conceptual blackout when values of citizens and non-citizens alike were in jeopardy. Next slide. Next one, please. Uh, yeah, this, on the left is a column. Um, just walk you through the, the installation quickly. On the left is a column for Sally Hemings, uh, which he made specifically for the U.S. Pavilion in reference to the pavilion itself, the architecture of the pavilion, and um, we know that the U.S. Pavilion is an ode to Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Martin conjured um, uh, Sally Hemings, who was an enslaved African-American woman held by Thomas Jefferson, our third president, and was, Jefferson was also the father of Hemings' children. He created a conical form that reflected the Doric columns on the outside of the pavilion, and again, um, topped that form with a shackle that became almost figurative. On the right is a piece called Tabernacle that brings um, up a what was called a forage cap that was something worn during the Civil War by soldiers in the Union and the Confederacy. Next slide, please. Um, cloistered Doubt or Cloistered Redoubt is on the left, and Ashoke is another form. This piece was in bronze, and he was a uh, referring here to a hat, a textile that West African men wore, um, and this work 
brings out the warp and weft of that um, of that textile. Is there one more? No? Okay. Um, I will talk more about how essential it was during the U.S. Pavilion to really upend long-held perceptions and interpretations of Martin's work, but we can talk about that soon. Um, it's great to be here and to share the stage with all of you, and um, our, our project with Simone Lee's Sovereignty is currently on view in Venice, and will be on view till the end of November, so if you have the opportunity to go, um, I urge you to do so. Um, so our origin story of uh, how this project came to be is um, maybe a little atypical. I was working with Simone on her first survey exhibition. I invited her in 2019. She had never had a survey. And I said, you know, I think it's about time that we look at 20 years of your practice. And I invited her to do that at the ICA in Boston. Uh, as we were working together, I had this kind of I would say sort of pressing belief, almost gut feeling, that what she had been doing all along for the last 20 years, but only becoming more visible recently in terms of market and museum uh, uh, visibility, this feeling that it needed an even bigger stage. So I said to her, I said, you know, what if we put our name in for Venice? It's a long shot, but let's give it a go. And it's a very opaque uh, application system. Uh, you do apply through the State Department, uh, and we put in our application in a very, I would say, quick manner that only later did I understand was atypical. Uh, we took about six weeks to put it together. We didn't have time to go to Venice or, you know, do any kind of prep work, and we submitted our application in February of 2020. And then we waited. And we thought, well, we'll never get this. And we continued our work on the on the survey show. And lo and behold, we were lucky enough to get the commission. But by that point, the world had changed. Obviously, there was a pandemic, and we the entire way of working was upended. So we flipped the script, and we decided that Venice would come first, and the survey exhibition would come afterwards. And that, in fact, is what 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 is what will happen, and that the work from Venice will come and form the nucleus of her survey exhibition, which will then travel throughout the United States. Um, and then a few other things happened. The Biennale was uh, delayed for a year due to the pandemic, so we had more time than most, but also we could not visit. Uh, we only visited Venice twice. Uh, actually, Simone only visited once before the opening in April uh, of this year, and sh when she visited, she had already made all of the work. So what happened is that there was a kind of time traveling through research, through memory, through the generosity of those who had come before us as commissioners, curators, and artists. And I would say the time was also a blessing in that the ideas deepened, uh, they became richer. And I'll maybe talk about what I think is the most groundbreaking move. Um, that Simone did for the pavilion, which really was this catalyst for thinking about the history of the pavilion itself and the idea of adjacent histories. So next slide. This is what the pavilion looks like now. Uh, so Simone, in a groundbreaking, brilliant move, turned the pavilion into a sculpture itself. And as we saw from Perrier's installation and from previous other artists, there had been quite a few artists that really were uh, fighting against the building, making work that really was in juxtaposition to the building, its, its, its history, its complex history. Uh, but here she completely turned it on its head and created a sculpture out of the building. And the catalyst for this, the sculpture in, in a sense, is this thatched roofing, it's a facade um, that completely transforms the building. But I would say it doesn't erase or cover the building, it works in juxtaposition with the building. As we just heard, the building is a neoclassical building, reminiscent of Monticello, and it opened in 1930. Next slide, just to remind you of what the building looks like. Opened in 1930, and uh, this is at the height of Jim Crow uh, era in the United States and anti-black violence. It's also the rise of anti-Semitism and fascism in Europe. 
In fact, Mussolini was in attendance at the opening of the U.S. Pavilion in 1930. And Simone became interested in the adjacency of histories, this in 1930, and another event in 1931, next slide please, was, which was the Paris Colonial Exposition. This was a World Fair, a World Expo, over 7 million people attended, uh, that was then displaying the uh, lands under colonial rule in Paris uh, by a number of European countries. And this World Expo had pavilions, national pavilions, uh, Togo and Cameroon are what you are looking at here. And this adjacency of history, 1931 for the Expo, 1930 for the U.S. Pavilion, became the catalyst for Simone to think about the, this idea of a World's Fair, about national representation. Because essentially the Biennale and the Giardini, where we have these pavilions that are in their architecture embodying the national ideals of that particular country, of course has this, its roots in these, these world expos and these world fairs. So she took these motifs uh, from these pavilions and transformed the U.S. pavilion into what she calls an African palace. Next slide. And the other thing that was quite a bold statement is a bold statement that in addition to this transformation of the pavilion, she also um, uh, situated a large-scale bronze sculpture, uh, 24 feet high. If any of you saw Simone's sculpture on the High Line brick house, that was 19 feet high. So just to give you a sense, unfortunately, we don't have a person for scale here, but you can enter underneath the sculpture. And as you can see, the sculpture is very clearly a reference to the female body, and for its head, crowning its head, is a satellite dish. So this becomes a beacon, not only for receiving ideas, but transmitting ideas, ideas that are throughout the exhibitions around uh, the legacy of colonialism, uh, the invisibility of labor, and specifically uh, female labor and black women's labor, uh, ideas also of, of the body and, and the body as a site of labor and nourishment and sustenance. These are all ideas that are built into, in a way you could see the show just from the exterior of the pavilion and then are further elaborated on in the exhibition. We can talk later more about the exhibition, but I wanted to say one thing, which is um, the project is more than an exhibition. When you apply and make your application to the State Department, at least now, I don't know how it was uh, in 2009, but the State Department does um, ask for uh, uh, ways in which your project can have an impact both locally and, meaning in the United States, and also locally in Venice, so internationally and locally. So education programs are a big part of the exhibition. It's not just putting an artist's work on you. So with us, we have a collaboration with Spelman College, um, which uh, is still still ongoing. And we also just finished a teacher training program with middle school teachers uh, in Italy as a collaboration with the Guggenheim uh, Foundation. Um, and so these are activities that are in a way invisible because they're more behind the scenes, but are really crucial to how the State Department um, asks you as a commissioner to envision a project. Um, and then finally, I will say the culminating event for this project is still to come. In October, we are hosting a three-day convening titled Loophole of Retreat in Venice, uh, where Simone is gathering 84 participants, all women, uh, all black women. They are artists choreographers, filmmakers, academic scholars, and this three-day convening is conceived of as an artwork. So that the, the exhibition is so much more than just the pavilion and the objects uh, in the exhibition. It's really a project that um, has many tentacles and many arms. So I just wanted to make sure to say that because it's, I think, become increasingly mm -hmm. important uh, a, a criteria that the State Department has been looking at uh, increasingly. Great, thank you, thank you. That was a great, a great introduction and overview. And I guess I would start just acknowledging um, a that all of the artists that you guys have worked with were thinking about the pavilion in relationship to a much broader practice, um, and either that meant 
you know, as you were describing, Ava, like the pavilion and what Simone did with this installation, having all of these various arms and tentacles, to um, your work with Nauman, Carlos, where you actually have said that you were kind of challenging the ideological underpinnings of the pavilion itself by spreading the installation out across the city. And I'm just wondering, um, maybe, maybe Carlos would be the best person to, to speak to this. I mean, did you, your show was really the only kind of retrospective, because your a retrospective exhibition, Ava, is sort of an outgrowth of the installation in Venice, but it is not what is in, in the pavilion itself. You, Carlos, were taking a very different model with, with how your conceit would spread and expand now this practice. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that. How did these moments really push your artists into a new direction? Same push and growth, the same. You don't push through. Okay. Gently encouraged. So there was a question of the new work. I don't know if you face that with the State Department, but you know, the way in which happened for us was there was a call and he was like, well, okay, you made this proposal and the proposal was used in the site. I would say I wasn't like, um, you know, I was conscious of it. If you go to my first life, you know, you will see that um, we use a work called, uh, called Vices and Virtues around the pavilion. Um, I don't think I'm, I don't see it. Uh, and Vices and Virtues is a work that uh, you know, goes all around the pavilion because for, it, it's interesting how much the pavilion is perceived as a frontispiece. You know, you have all these pictures and it's always the front, right? I think it's so loaded, both architecturally and symbolically. But the truth is that the pavilion is a volume existing in a volume, in, 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 in a situation. And when you recover the the full volumetric of the pavilion, do you, you also recover its insertion in the larger jardin. So that was important for us, both literally and metaphorically. Well, so for instance, some pictures go all around. The window at the back was open. You can see them in there. And then we also opened the window to the side, which also uh, was open, you know, near us, a uh, beautiful show. And um, yes, of course, there it, it, it was a play, you know, I mean, you know, with the, the symbolic meaning as well. But the idea was not to go against the pavilion, but just to show how much the pavilion was part of, a, of, of an environment, you know, of an ecology, let's say, which is both political, aesthetic, and, uh, and how that ecology belonged to a larger ecology of the city and underline the role of the universities in that ecology, you know. So it was just trying to connect, basically, connect those things, connect, connect, connect. In terms of, so that's a kind of like a kind of a curatorial operation. In terms of growth, we got that call, okay, so will there be new work? And, you know, uh, and um, Angela was one of his Bruce long time William was saying, don't ask Bruce to produce a new work for this because he's not going to do it, right? So we were just trying to, and, but we, but we knew that there was in the world. But you know, so it was like so complicated in terms of, you know, it ended up that you know what we proposed originally was what we felt it was a sort of a challenging way of thinking about a retrospective because it was a kind of retrospective, but it was in three sides and it was organized according to threads threads in, in, which were that I would call like phrases, almost like musical phrases that would go from one place of the work to another place of the work and they were all like calling it in the time. And so he was trying to present the way in which one could really think about the work which was not according to a chronology or a thematic approach per se. And that would have to be, you know, somewhat um, uh, coordinated in three sides of the social chair. Um, so that was the, the, the point of the architecture. So ultimately, yes, it was in work. And then Bruce came to Venice and, you know, for a visit and made another work in Venice. And then we recreated all the work working with students. And the, the work that he did was, you know, a version of days called Journey, in which all the voices are voices of the students at the university. And, you know, it, it, it ended up all being very well. I have to, um, 
I, I know I want to get to your book because um, you, and this has sort of come up already, and I don't mean to digress, but the way that Ava described how she went through the application process, and Carlos, how you described how you went through the application process, gets back to this question of like, how does this actually happen, really? What are the what are the visible guidelines and what are sort of the unspoken rules? I mean, look, I know you used that phrase with me the other day when we were talking about this panel. You were saying there's some unspoken rules and then there's some well-known guidelines. Can you talk a little bit about that? Then I want to hear more about that. Um, a lot is online, but a lot is under the surface, and it helps to chat with colleagues who come before you um, when you realize the benefits. We were notified um, in a telephone call in June of 2018 that Martin had been selected to open the exhibition in May of 2019. That was somewhat delayed. I think typically people are informed either in late winter or spring. Um, maybe an art exhibition in Venice was not a priority for that administration. Um, but nonetheless, we had to work quickly to, for Martin to finish works that were made, that were in progress in the studio, and get those um, completed, get new work completed, because shipping was in March of 2019 for an opening in May of 2019. Um, the State Department works closely with the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, to convene a panel um, that's called the Federal Advisory Committee for International Exhibitions. And that's a panel of curatorial colleagues, um, museum directors, people in the field. And they deliberate over the proposals that are submitted by nonprofit institutions from across the country. You would probably expect that there would be hundreds and hundreds of applications for the Ministry of Art. But in fact, there are about 10 or 12 each year um, who vie for the honor to bring their artists to Venice. Uh, the State Department then contributes about 5% uh, of the budget, and it's up to the curators and to the team to raise the rest of the funds um, to realize their show in Venice. So it's a big undertaking for any institution for any curator, and some institutions don't want to take that on um, because of the enormous significance of the work um, in terms of budget and in terms of bringing funders to, to each project. So that's an important factor, I'm sure, Ava, for you too, given the ambition of Simone's project. Can you say a little bit about that piece of it? Um, you know, the, the logistical complexities around that particular installation really stood out. Um, and I'm just wondering kind of how, how you arrived together at the, um, at the, at the construction that in, encircles the, the pavilion and also sort of what were some of the logistical challenges of actually working through how to do that, particularly coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, not only did we have a pandemic, we had a global supply chain a crisis and a war. Um, and, you know, the, the, when we were first notified, the Biennale was still in 2021, and we had about seven months. And so her plan what had always been to make bronzes, but as you may know, to make bronze, um, bronzes usually take about a year to make from beginning to, to end, to completion. It's quite an in-depth process. And the delay in the pandemic really allowed her to go deep in the bronze and, and really create these monumental works, and there's also bronzes inside, in addition to ceramics. So for us, the logistical challenge uh, really became a lot about shipping. Uh, these bronzes are heavy. Um, they go on boats. Those boats take a long time. Ports were a mess. So we had a similar challenge to what I think Brooke was describing, and really ensuring that the artist had enough time to make the most ambitious work of her career. Um, but to make sure that it got to Venice in time. Um, furthermore, we have to do quite a lot of work to the pavilion itself in order to receive these works. Uh, not just the thatch roofing uh, facade piece, but the sculptures are so heavy, both the ceramics and the bronzes. And you can go to the next slide. Um, that we have to reinforce the floors. Uh, 
in order to receive some of these works, which are a couple thousand pounds um, at the smallest of them. Um, so the work became uh, quite technical, working with architects, which I know, you know booked it as well. Um, you partner with uh, local architects who actually file and get permits for you. This is, the U.S. Pavilion is a historic listed building. So anything you do to the pavilion, you have to bring it back to its original state. It's like uh, you have to go through a landmarks commission. And a landmarks commission in Venice is no joke. They know, they know their historic buildings. And you really rely on a team of experts in Italy that are your partners. And our challenge was we didn't get to meet these people when we saw them on Zoom until the very end. So it's difficult to build those relationships when those individuals are advocating for you and, and working, you know, night and day for, for to realize this, this. So I have to say, you know, the pleasure was watching Simone develop the work, um, but, and I tried to shield her as much as possible from the challenge, the logistical challenge of getting it done. And I do want to say that the, what Brooke was mentioning, the, you know, the things that people tell you is there's a kind of, I don't know, passing of information from commissioners to commissioners. And, you know, I really want to thank Brooke, also Paul Ha, who commissioned Ben Burns in 2015 when he was in Boston. So I could actually, you know, see him in person and say, how do I do this? You know, those are really crucial in, in being able to pull off, uh, you know, these ambitious um, uh, installations. And, and there's no way besides the fundraising, there's just no way that we could have achieved this without the help of so many people um, in order to, to do it. And I think that you as a curator and the artist come to the U.S. Pavilion in a sense with an understanding that this represents the country, but that that symbol that seems foundational to America is has baffling fragility that's built in, not only to this physical structure of the building, which is compromised now, and which we don't have had to fix and attend to, or our colleagues and our teams did, um, but also that the historic meaning of this building for a black artist like Martin Perry was something, was a condition that you had to take on and dismantle um, and conquer and consider every single step um, of the entire process. So that building is your initial gambit and how you relate to that building, how your artist relates to it, I think is what you leave with. I mean, the, the, the outdoor, the publicness, and the presentation in publicness is how your presentation leads and what people think about your project in, inside. Yeah, and I'm just picking up on that too. I mean, it is when you talk about the relationship of the architect with Monticello to these historical images, to these, to these troubling, you know, image, images from the 19th century, but as, as Ada, you pointed out, the building was constructed in 1930 during the rise of fascism and anti Semitism. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, though, it's such a loaded uh, icon of American culture, but it's within a global and international space. And I'm just wondering, to what degree were you as curators navigating the positioning of the pavilion within the broader Biennale um, as, a, as a whole within Venice, um, and, and also within the organizational structure of the curation, you know, the, the broader curation of, of, of the events um, as it was unfolding? Who wants to take that on? Carlos? <laughs> Taking turns here. Uh, the, we might want to show the two images of the uh, other side and want to give them a little bit of a bit. But, you know, as I said, um, the idea, I, I think the following is the two images of the interior of the pavilion. Right. That's been the pavilion. And then you see one of the first sides. That's the entrance of Kafoskari, which is historically the uh, oldest university in Venice, and they have some spaces that we use, and then we move forward. And this is the work that we reconstructed, working with students from the time of the 1970s, the work that was just had originally presented in the Bahrain and in Japan, in Tokyo, at the 
sign in that uh, the uh, entrance, the sign that I was talking about was for the UR. And in the UR, there were no exhibition spaces, so we used the actual spaces of the university, including what they call, if you move forward, you can see, yeah. That's the aula mania. So that's the, the, the room that it's used. It's, a, it's an old refectory. It's an ancient refectory. But it's a room that is used for conferences. So they basically work as well. So, so it was really intimate, uh, the collaboration with the, with the university at, at that level. Um, the curator at the time of the venue was Daniel Gilbaum, who is a friend. He was traveling with Pablo Barata, so it was not really so easy. So he was basically saying, you know, whatever, you know, do whatever you like, and the communication was quite very easy. Um, and yes, I think that the, from what concerns, um, and the State Department was, uh, as you said, very interested in what we would do with the, the local conditions of collections and venues, so they really embraced this idea of an internet participation of the students at all levels. But do you want to do you want to speak to that question a little bit? How the Martin's installation locked into something within the BNL as a whole? Um, when we were uh, working on the exhibition, almost midway through the theme, when we were living in distant times, Ralph Bluebox, um, uh, a large exhibition of the Arsenal and the Giovanni was announced and worked in that. A meeting with that, but really, um, practically and pragmatically, we were just busting it to get this exhibition completed um, and shipped to um, to Venice and to have all the work done in time and to open the whole previous in May. But did you? I mean, you were working very independently of of the of the curation of the of the BNL as a whole, of the thematic structure, as well as what's happening at other pavilions. Because when you enter as a visitor and as a curator, you're experiencing this whole. You're passing through these alleys and, and, and roads, as it were, in the garden path, and these different pavilions are feeling synthetic. But it's really, everybody is working really in their own, they're staying in their own lane, as, as it were, as, as the process is unfolding. Is that correct? Or, or are you in dialogue with other curators, thinking through the problems and the issues? Are you there on site at the same time with your colleagues? How, how does that work? Uh, well, I would say yes and no. We are mostly working in a silo and independently, as Rick was saying. We're just trying to get it done. But there are opportunities for exchange. Um, you know, Chitulia Alamani is one of the Grimm's exhibition, which is show uh, of the Biennale is, uh, you know, her themes were announced while many of us working on our individual pavilions had already developed our themes and questions. Um, so we had some meetings, they were on Zoom, which was fantastic. All the commissioners uh, of all the national pavilions were invited. Uh, there were something like 150 people on one Zoom, and it would take five hours to get through each country in alphabetical order. It was very organized. Um, but what was interesting is we would have informal discussions and what emerged, at least in our case, is although we were working somewhat in siloed conditions, there was a lot, of, maybe it's something in the air or in the water, there were a lot of um, shared interests. And I would say uh, specifically with Chichilia's show, which, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of women artists, a lot of artists of color, um, you know, more so than any previous uh, Biennale exhibition had a lot of really resounding resonances with a number of the pavilions. Um, in addition, this was maybe more in the press and less to do with artistic um, uh, conversations, but there were a number of pavilions uh, this year that were so-called close. So Ms. Sedona is the first black woman to represent the United States. Sonia Boyce in the UK is also the first black woman to represent the UK. We had the first Sami pavilion, our neighbors in the Nordic pavilion. Um, pavilion. Uh, there's a Roma artist in the uh, Polish pavilion, also a first. Um, in the French pavilion, the first uh, French artist of Algerian descent. So there was a lot that was sort of made of these efforts, I would say, from a curatorial or artistic perspective. You know, Sonia and Simone have known each other since the 80s and admire one another. Um, it, it 
was more these kind of overlaps and coincidences that helped became really rich, but I would say weren't exactly planned. But I think to me points to a moment in what many of us are working on when thinking about artists and creators alike. Um, and then the final thing I'll say about it to that is Simone is represented in the Julia show, which I think is in recent memory the first time that the artist in the U.S. Pavilion also has a major presentation in, uh, in her case in Arsenale. And so for us, it was a particularly interesting reflection of Tertullia when we learned that her piece for house uh, would be featured quite prominently in Tertullia's show, and we, of course, you know, uh, have a prominent bronze up there statuary as well. And so that became another layer uh, to this conversation. If these are decisions that were made independently, and then once we knew of them, we thought, you know, these are great press opportunities, great visitor opportunities for people to make connections across the Jersey and across the city. One thing that you said, and I'm just going back to, to the history of the Roman Catholic, I want you to remember that what we call now the Italian Pavilion. It used to be the place where the exhibition was. Uh, and then the, the pavilions were, were uh, created in a way based on the 20th century, right? Uh, the first Pavilion being 1995, right? And celebrating the birth of uh, the Regina and the uh, Queen. Uh, through its history, there's been times in which different commissioners of the Bahamian have attempted to coordinate the pavilions with more or less degree of efficiency. But it's very difficult just because the, pro the individual processes of each pavilion in terms of the selection processes are so diverse and so different in terms of not only the procedure but also the timing of them. Right? So, uh, I, as far as I remember, the most successful also was Attila and Interviva. I mean, I remember in the 80s when he determined that the Pavilion was an age of, you know, the merging of the conversations of the globalization, and he asked each Pavilion to select an artist uh, of a non national at the time. And most Pavilions did it. But there's no way in which the commissioners of the Pavilion can enforce any decision in terms of the national Pavilions, which are really the sovereign territory. Which is really interesting. Where do they conservate their Well, I do um, thank you, and, and I do want to take the last few minutes just to um, open the floor, I guess, to some questions. I mean, you know, for uh, for all of you, in a way, uh, no matter how established your artist is or was when they entered into the to the phase of really creating and representing the United States, I mean, it's. It's such a huge, uh, all eyes on you in this moment uh, experience, and the stakes are feeling so high. And one of the things we didn't touch on is the Golden Lion, and where that kind of fits the award of the Golden Lion. Um, perhaps someone will, will ask that um, in the next few minutes. But I do want to open up the floor to any questions or conversations or remarks um, jumping out of this discussion. I know to be very patient, yes. I found it interesting that uh, you know, the the and the and this year is another one. Um, have there been others, and uh, do you see this being something that's going to continue on for a while, like the program that we've been advising for most of the time? Is that directed to anyone in particular? Do you know Ava, do you want to answer? I'm not sure, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question, but whether the treatment of the building is something that might happen in the future, or? Oh, I see what you're saying, that would be a first. I hope so, and I hope that they're not just going to be first. I hope that it will be, you know, just like, other artists showing that these are not making headlines. And I think, you know, this year it was, um, you know, this idea first, I think, you know, the artists, at least that I spoke with, and speaking with Simone on one level, and she spoke about this publicly, you know, feeling proud to be the first black woman to, to represent the United States, but also that that should not be the headline. The work should be the headline, uh, and the idea should be the headlines. 
so, you know, I do hope that we will continue to see uh, a variety of different practices, methodologies, and artists, um, but that, you know, we communicate with the art first um, and that these ideas are first and that they will be the better way and we can as part of the natural evolution. Anyone else? Is part of part of the and um, if you look at the, the publications of the government, you will notice that they're quite thin in general. I think that we were really, I mean, we were very lucky we managed to do a book, and then later, because few charitable trusts, you know, allow us to do a picture book of the three sides, you know, so we were very lucky. But in general, there's nothing very clean in terms of the, the state department that allows you to really produce a substantial publication. So, uh, you know. There's something I have to say that Gordon, after you know, organizing the show, we all become, you know, in one way or another, a little attached to that religion. And I'm always hoping that we will all make a, a sort of a public claim for that pavilion to be repossessed by the United States government and to really be funded appropriately. I think that will be a beautiful thing for all of us to do because right now it's really like a kind of a little corner that nobody wants. You know? And I think that. Everybody deserves better, you know. Uh, so I, I think that that would be, you know, a beautiful thing for us to do all together at some point. And I guess, following on that line of thinking, what I've been wondering is, what if the Ukraine did their exhibition in the U.S. pavilion, and what if the pavilions from Chile and Guatemala that are in the more Somali come into the GRB and take over their pavilions? So maybe the sacrosanct symbols of nationhood should be disbanded somehow or reconsidered, and maybe the BNLA would be energized going forward with that sort of a shakeup or upending these long-held uh, architectural meanings of this country. Yes, I, I, I wanted to. They don't, they don't know what to do. I mean, the Jardines have been in interesting, you know, they were created by the Napoleonic invasion. I mean, there were no Jardines in there, no Jardines. You know, all that part of the city, look at the ancient maps, you know, there's nothing there. So, you know, the Napoleon takes over the Republic, it's given to the Austrians, and the Austrians do all this more, um, you know, improvement to the city, like, you know, they steal all the work from the same churches, like they put them in the academia. They paid a lot of canals and to, you know, in circulation and they created the garden. So, the Venetians didn't know what to do with that. They had other public spaces, you know, they had the Alto and they had, uh, you know, the market and so forth. So, basically, at some point, point after the, uh, Italy becomes a republic, they decide to use them for an international exhibition. Now, the Venetians. This is the 1890s, right? This is 1895. The Vallinians has tried to activate the gardens, and you know, most recently, Barata said the Jardines should be open all year round. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But because the Vallinians are only funded for the show, then you know, there's nothing to open the door. Anymore. So the question of the Vallinians enters into the ecology of the city of Venice in a really intimate way, and poses really interesting questions about the responsibility that the countries have in relationship to their historic city. Well, I think that's that's a great note to end on. Look, I also just want to recognize what a brilliant idea because one of the questions you know we all have to ask ourselves at, at this point is you know what is what is the future of the national pavilion? What does that mean um, today? And I, I love your recommendation of just thinking about trading out the, the different identities of, of countries and, and, and that kind of exchange and not and, and not holding so rigorously and stridently to the established way that the So thank you all very much, and thank you for joining us today. And um, thank you.